This is Rod Gels at the Rock Band Program Podcast. I am here with Derek Houston. Yep. From the Green Room in Harrisburg. He has been the owner, the producer, the creative head, and all that kind of business for that Green Room for almost 20 years, or has it been 20 years at this point? Um it, it's been the green room since the mid nineties. My involvement started in like fall of 2013. And then I took over the, the business in the summer of 2005. So we're looking at 17 years of ownership. All right. Um, yeah. Good God. Cause that's right out of college. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you had a I plan. Forget, I, I forget about, I mean, it was the craziest uh, couple years. It was, uh, 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 you know, this opportunity more or less, fell into my lap and I didn't know what to do with it. It was like a hot potato. And uh, luckily my parents were just very encouraging and supportive. I still take pride in the fact that I did not rely on them for financials. They, they, they keep in mind, this is before um, a big financial crisis in 2008. So as a 23 year old, I could go into a bank and actually discuss taking out a, uh, an SBA loan and not getting rejected instantly mm -hmm. i did get them to co-sign because i didn't own anything at that time so uh but i was lucky and very grateful that they would at least put their name on a piece of paper yes. and, and say like hey you know just try to make sure a bank doesn't come and like seize our assets yeah. as you drop the ball <laughs> yeah, they just want to see their kick kick ass <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that that was the only I, to be honest i probably would have just like thought I, I i think i called them i was like well that gig's over you know they're selling the business and i'm gonna have to go find other work and they were like what do you mean like they're selling the business why don't you consider oh, yeah. taking it over and i'm like is that even a like is that well, you're 23 I would, I would i would say the same thing <laughs> yeah. i was like who me <laughs> yeah yeah so how'd you get your start when music take it back to the beginning um uh Honestly, I didn't grow up in a musical family. Um, There's a lot of music being listened to. Um, I thought I was like fascinated that my dad always had music playing, had a really nice stereo in the basement, good, you know, curated mix of music, mostly classic rock, but not just that genre. And uh, so it was just, a, I, I just remember certain songs. I just couldn't get enough of it. And I was like infatuated with the sounds and, and then you know, in fourth grade, everybody, you know, gets pulled into a band room and they explain how band works and everything. And, and I was like, yeah, why not? You know, and, uh, took up trumpet and, um, I just never, to be honest, I never really learned to read. I just kept on faking it by ear All right. for years and years and years. Cause the reading, my ear was that faster is, than my yeah. reading. Um, which I think frustrated a lot of teachers, but it didn't really hinder my uh, ability to play. Yeah. So um, I, I just kind of faked it. And then guitar was uh, shortly after in like seventh grade, um, which was crazy. Uh, you know, found myself, I forget what really got me into guitar. Um, I think just like the music that was coming out seemed accessible. And so what year are we talking? That would have been 94 the year uh, I was, I was pretty into sports and then 94, the uh, major league baseball strike. There's like a summer of like, no, no baseball. Major. So that's what, that's, yeah. what, that's what you and, just, <laughs> I got a guitar for my 13th birthday, but my parents, they said, we'll get you. It was a, this cheap little, you know, guitar from a store up the street. And they said, we're going to get this for you, but you have to take lessons. And of course, no kid wants to hear that. They just want to like, you know, I mean, this is before YouTube, so I definitely would have been like SOL if I had uh, not taken lessons. Yeah, I think probably in 1994, though, you had it pretty good because 19, like when I started, it was it was still like, uh, it was still, you had to go Buffalo Gals. <laughs> in other words, I've been interviewing people I interview. It's like, hey, sure, I would have taken lessons. That would have been a lot easier if people would teach me what I wanted and needed to learn. But instead, yeah. it's Buffalo Gals or, or uh, something goofy. But yeah, by 1994, 1994 is the year Kurt Cobain died. That was the, the Nirvana years. Grunge. It, just, it seemed accessible. You know, yeah. um, it seemed. You do this. Like punk rock, Green Day was coming up. 
Green Day was another one where it's like, okay, I learned this one shape and I can just move it around and I can sound like these guys. And of course that quickly exhausted itself because I'm, you know, anybody you, you, I'm like, I could learn that. Now what else can I learn? You know, and it just started this, this spiral of like, I just could not get enough. And um, so that was kind of like, you know, the, the, the band start, I always appreciate like having like a formal, you know, uh, symphonic band. Um, I actually played trumpet through the middle of college. Until, I cannot like, imagine how you did that without reading. <laughs> without what? Reading. Well, well, <laughs> I know. I mean, I had a base. Okay. So 11th grade was when I took a, a I went to a really good music school. Um, I should say a really good public school with a great music program, Lampeter Strasburg High School. Okay. Um, like a quarter of the band was, uh, I'm sorry, a quarter of the student body was in like the marching band. Okay. So it was kind of accepted and cool and it wasn't nerdy to be in the band. And we yeah. were able to do both. You could play sports and do band, which I thought was a huge perk that most people didn't get that option so um you didn't have to choose between the two you could do both and um and that carried me through like i said i played trumpet through uh through college the, the lvc orchestra which was awesome which if you know anything about third trumpet you're playing like two notes for an entire piece oh yeah, so yeah. It, was, it was an easy credit yeah, yeah. full notes and half notes and it's more counting than playing yeah, the occasional eighth note yeah yeah so I'm, yeah i come from a family of trumpet players but i flunked out but you play in the symphonic band, you're, you're, your arms are up the whole time, but if yeah. you play in orchestra, you're just sitting and counting. And yeah. that, I was like, oh, this is an easy credit, you know? Um, yeah, 36 uh, minutes of silence. <laughs> I got to listen to like cellists and, and violinists and yeah. all these amazing musicians. I just sat in the middle of them. I was like, this is awesome, you know? And I barely had to play. <laughs> it's so much fun. It is. But that background, I, th I was really, I thought that was, uh, was cool. Like having um, that fundamental. Mm-hmm understand that foundation and then also mixing it with you know pop rock at the time um yeah. it was cool i could live both worlds and enjoy it yeah yeah so i like the fact that we were talking earlier um like earlier earlier and you were talking about like when you were growing up you got the real like your dad would say you know kid it's not really sounding like jimmy page <laughs> i'll never forget yeah, my, my, my dad didn't know who Jimmy Page was. So they, uh, but, uh, they were honest with me. They were well, that's good. That's, that's the best. Parents, that's the best thing you can do with your kids. Mm -hmm. Don't deplete them, but don't feed them in a full of butterflies and rainbows. Because it's hard when you, when you, when you get out of your high school bubble, where at the time I was one of the only guitarists in my high school. It wasn't is like today it seems like everybody plays guitar mm -hmm. but um it just wasn't i and then you know I, I got into lebanon valley and um i was looking around i was like man there's some killer players here like i didn't know that like you know i we have our friend logan i'm sorry kevin neidig was there and not when i was there luckily that would have probably intimidated me and i would have left yeah. <laughs> but um uh it, it was an eye opener you know i wasn't the the youngest coolest kid in town anymore yeah. like that, that feel uh it was an eye opener there's just incredible not even the guitarists some of my friends that played sax and keyboards and stuff they were just really um impressive and and incredible musicians and uh it was inspiring um but it was an eye opener and i think that was a big thing with again a message to parents is like your kids are going to eventually get out of this bubble that they're in where they're a big fish in a little pond or, or or even a little fish in a big pond who knows and when they transition that's important that they can do it without getting swallowed up and yeah. and, and intimidated yeah um, it's, all right. growth, it's all right to fail yeah yeah part i thought my learning, growth was, was part of the learning made, process yeah, because it's easy in arts, you know, the way it is, it's easy to get discouraged and uh, you're, you're just constantly doubting yourself. And if, if, if there's a period that's too long where you're just not being inspired, you know, you lose it and, mm -hmm. and, and you move on and no offense, but you become an accountant or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No offense, accountants. Yeah, again. My dad was an accountant, so <laughs> he was a trumpet player too. So that that's exactly right. That's exactly right. But it's like, uh, 
So after after uh, well, you had what was your first your bands the first band you were playing in? Oh my gosh, I played a band. Well, I got to college and we just thought like a couple of us got together and and wanted to just play just to to I don't know maybe even run some covers and just keep our chops up. And then um, that band was called <laughs> Locrian. It was a kind of weird uh, nerdy. I was, I was gonna say yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, that's cool though because it opened a lot of doors and while it, it, it and it did last like I, we got some great gigs out of it because we were in college and we were able to yeah. pull a crowd so like the chameleon would book us and, and like with like breaking benjamin and stuff like yeah, yeah. Know, cool gigs and that's when i learned actually that it didn't necessarily matter how we were good musicians we didn't really have the song writing process down but we also brought a crowd out and that was the business side of things was like we hustled that side and that got me, you know, I looked back, and I was like, wow, like I, it got me uh, a bigger network of people, all this stuff, the business side of things. And it, it clicked is like, okay, maybe it's not about writing the best song as much as I think that is the, the, the ultimate goal yeah. is to write the perfect song. The business side of thing carried me really far and um, without having songs in my opinion. And, uh, and I didn't ignore that at any point, you know, I was like, you know, it's crazy how far we got without, having any real songs <laughs> you know? well were you just so, a cover band no we had some originals but i just i, I just don't think any of us understood how to properly write song it never yeah. felt like there was a, a method to it to the madness okay. um, and we, we threw covers in but um i would later really rub elbows with real songwriters and yeah. um i was like okay this is how it's done you know okay you know adam yeah yeah adam Patrick was a he, I learned a ton from him. I learned a lot of really good stuff about, yeah, the, the songs, um, touring, you know, just um, being a road dog, how to take care of yourself on the road was yeah. a big thing. Uh, um, he might not know that he imparted that knowledge, but it was, you know, how to eat right, how to get, you know, get yourself some sleep, how it can snowball if you don't take care of yourself yeah. uh, night after night. And uh, yeah. So you so, okay? So you you gone through Lebanon Valley College just as a, and then you have you graduate. Your graduate was like production. What was it? It was not just production. It was. It's a bachelor of music. Um, so it's basically useless. It's like okay, you you took all these courses, but it's not like a teacher's you know certificate yeah. or even a a performance degree in that yeah. you know it's an arts degree. It's just a bachelor of music and. Um, with an emphasis in, in recording, I guess. And they, um, had quite a, they had quite a setup. Yeah, yeah. That that was the cool thing about LVC was it was small, and they would get you into studio. Pretty much, your sophomore year, you were in the studio. The freshman year, you were in it, but you weren't, you know, really doing projects. Mm -hmm. But great setup. Um, very accessible. You know, you can get keys, sign them out, and and. I would be in there doing like all nighters and, and they had an incredible studio. When I was there, uh, they, uh, I think as a donation, they received like Bon Jovi's mixing desk from, from his house in Jersey. Okay. Uh, I think he donated it as like a tax write off. And also uh, Jazzy Jeff uh, had the same one. And I think donated that too for okay. like parts. So, I mean, we had good gear, you know, really good gear. Um, it was a small, well-funded program, I thought, um, and, and professors were accessible. Um, I, th I think, you know, the, the, I know a lot of people that went there before me now, I didn't really know them at the time, but, um, and it's got like a nice little legacy of, of quality, you know, musicians and, and, and engineers and stuff. I'll be somewhere at a gig and like the guy running sounds an LVC guy or you know yeah half the band's LVC guys one of my one of my uh bass uh mentors Jim Miller was the head of yep. bass. he was the he was the bass guru third stream yeah so that was uh you recorded third stream I'm sorry did you record third stream I think I mixed something for him but I never um I'm not sure who else is in. oh my god <laughs> something just fell down the steps uh um we i think we mixed some stuff of theirs um okay. but uh my my one of my best friends dave yanger took lessons with uh yep stroman and um and, 
always somebody we looked up to. Guys are like crazy good, you know? Oh, yeah. All those guys were, yeah. Yeah, they can play anything. And then Jim yeah, Miller, I don't know Strowman, but Jim Miller wasn't an elitist either. He, he likes he, he likes a lot of music. He does a he did a lot of music. Yeah, I mean that's that, extreme, but he, he he was he was an open mind. Mm-hmm. So all those guys were. I mean, I did a I, I I you know traditionally you were supposed to. I took lessons with Joe Mixon. I don't know if he's still there, but he was he was a really good guitarist, and I I knew he was a really good blues guitarist, and that was. You know, I had to do two years of classical and two years of jazz, and um, I really wasn't into either. <laughs> um, so I just said, I was like, man, I know you can play blues like a, like a beast. Like, we just do like at least a semester, maybe a year of just, just focus on some blues stuff. He was like, okay. I was like, oh, awesome. You know, so that was easy. Yeah. Yeah. And times have changed. Them. I'm sorry. We can learn, we can learn in these be contemporary styles now. When I was in college, all it was was classical. Like I went to Berkeley for two years and that mm-hmm. was an open thing, everything. Then yeah. you go back to Pennsylvania and everything is like, it has to be classical guitar. Yeah. 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 And I, that was actually a thing that my parents, were wonder, my parents were wondering why I'm dropping out all the time. Well, that's, that's, that kind of deterred me from um, Duquesne. I was pretty close to going to Duquesne, you know, I, without, you know, my bags were almost packed and, and I just was like, man, I just, there's something about OVC, just the open. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I always say like my, my junior recital, which wasn't a requirement, you had to do a sophomore one, but the junior I did, I did a half recital with them, um, split it with Dave Yenger, which, um, and um, I did like Stevie Ray Vaughan tune and, and like a Modesky Martin and Wood song. And like, and, and people like, you know, I, I think Jim Miller was there. There was a, a, you know, the, the faculty gives you reviews and stuff. And I just remember being like, getting ready to be ripped apart by the purists you know yeah yeah. and uh and it, it was happen. there were really good reviews and it was like oh this is why i'm here it was like encouraging yeah like, yeah it was well done, but it was it wasn't traditional you know wonderful yeah i wish i could say the same <laughs> <laughs> my colleague they were horrible they were like well berkeley's not up to our standards it's like okay so anyway so you graduate then okay, so tell us a story about how did you get involved with Bob Welsh in the green room? Well, so um, you know, I, I was uh, kicking around Lancaster after I—that's uh, where I grew up, and I, I was kind of aimlessly floating, and, and I just started calling some studios, and seeing you know, are there any opportunities to intern? And I had already done an internship at a big studio in Philly, which was cool, but it just didn't seem like the opportunities were there. Um, I really wished I could have gotten in there, but I also wasn't totally into the Philly scene. I was thinking like Atlanta or something. Um, and uh, where like some of my favorite records were made, you mm-hmm. know, like the Black Crows were out of there. Um, that's where I was thinking I was going to try and target. And I just ended up at um, um, calling the green room on a whim and Kathy, I think, answered or called back or something and, and was like, yeah, come on up, you know, let's talk about stuff. And I was like, Oh, okay. So I go up there and we, we clicked. It seemed like a really cool place to, to dig in. And, and, um, mm-hmm. and then within like a year and a half, um, you know, they had mentioned that they're, they're starting a family and I was able to work closely with Bob on certain projects. We did a uh, children's record for Hershey park, which was, was cool to get in on a, like a corporate gig, you know, mm-hmm doing music for a big company like that um got to play guitar on it and engineer it and everything yeah um and uh then you know they said well you know at the time kathy was pregnant with her first daughter and uh, so they kind of knew that they were going to be scaling back on the, the studio life and they're selling their house and moving and into a more you know suburban area and stuff so um I just, it was kind of like, all right, well, I don't want this to, de- to die. You know, I, yeah, I don't yeah. want to, to give up on. Tell, 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 tell everybody what you said about your dad. Well, <laughs> like, well like, uh, you're like, well, the studio is going out of business. And he goes, well, well, well what'd you buy? Yeah, I, you get well, that yeah. I remember they, they took me out for breakfast uh, one day and like, explained, like, like, this is what our plan is, you know, and, and, and kind of were like, and if you're interested in taking it over, 
you know, that would be the, the best option for everybody, we think, you know, but we certainly have other people in mind that we could discuss selling the business to. And so I called my parents and, and I'm like kind of numb after this. I'm like, dang it, like this was a cool situation. I'd already moved to Harrisburg. I was setting up roots here and everything. I was like, man, it's like, it's already over kind of before it started. And then um, I called my parents and they're like, yeah, why don't you consider, you know, buying it, you know? And, and I, as I told you, this was 2004, 2005 before the crazy banking crisis that mm -hmm. happened with mortgages. So you could walk into a bank and, and actually like discuss this stuff with a banker. Whereas today I think they just like, yeah. like go away kid, you know? Um, so I started talking and, you know, it came to be that, uh, you know, I, I own nothing. So I wasn't able to really get a loan without some kind of backing. So my parents co-signed just to, you know, put their name on it. Uh, so we could get the, the, the revenue for that to, to start it, to, to purchase the business. And it was, I don't think it would have happened had they not been kind of, um, it's wonderful. Yeah, it was, it was, it was really strange because, um, I shouldn't say strange, but it was, it was, it was a side of my parents. Like, I was just like, you guys are cool with this. Like most parents wouldn't even let their kids go to music school to begin with, let yeah. alone no, buy it. Later in life, you're, you're still a young man, but later in life, you'll look back at all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Cause like the love and trust and my, like my dad wanted me to be happy. Mm -hmm. He was an accountant. Yeah. He didn't understand any of this music crap. Yeah. Like, how are you going to make a money money at music? How are you going to do that? He expected me to fail, but he knew failure was a part of learning. That's a good, so, that's really good. Yeah. But as it turns out, you know, I had a thousand little failures, but also tenacity as you have, you have to have tenacity to do what you do. Oh yeah. I mean, I look at like, yeah, some of the things that I've been through with, uh, you know, there were two break-ins. There's, you know, a flood that was. I saw, I saw all the pictures of that. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, but I look at it and like, I, I actually, I'm, I'm happy for it because I'm like, because you, you fear those things happening, and and then you like live in fear, and fear kind of controls you, and then they happen, and you make your way through it somehow, mm -hmm. and you're like, hey, I'm still here. You know, sure. like that's what insurance is for. That's what you know, a network of friends who, who jump as soon as you're like, Oh my God, the water's rising. Can somebody, you know, yeah. and you, you're able to call on people. That's what all that stuff's for. And th those are the valuable things. Like everything yeah. else can kind of be replaced. You don't know that until, until disaster happens. Yep. You and you make it happen. Happen. I'm honestly like, I'm not looking forward to any of that stuff. happening. Of course, again, <laughs> but I'm not fearful of it. You know, yeah, yeah. that's the thing is I'm not yeah, living in fear. Yeah. 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 You'll attract that fear if you do. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, how did you think? Just so you, like, <laughs> so you, what did you start with? The did you have like were you one of those kids that had like a four track when you were? Uh... That was another. I said, said it, yeah, like there's several points that my parents really were instrumental. <laughs> no pun intended. Or oh pun yeah, intended. yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, when I was, I was playing in like a high school band, and like you know, anything that had an input um as far as like recording like a tape deck i'd be like oh we can use that we can make demos with that you know my dad had his nice kenwood stereo in the basement and had an input on the back i'm like oh you know i don't really I, I, you know maybe i went to radio shack and bought a cheap mic or even reverse the headphones like you used to be able to do you know and, and just like make demos and 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 so that like tinkering around with wires and tape decks and all kinds of various things my parents were like okay i think this kid needs something that like is a proper recording device and so they they sprung for uh, a task cam one of those four track uh port, not porta studio but you know like the that's what i had 19, yeah, I mean, 1988 dude, it was awesome and <laughs> yeah. i'm like it's one of those like i think I, they got it for me for christmas and i opened i was like I, I was like oh my god i can't believe like you know yeah yeah they, spring for a ton of stuff but they knew they they were good at knowing what was important they didn't spoil me in other ways as far as uh you know objects and, and gadgets and stuff um but that was like okay they understand that this is important to me they're providing this for me so that was a big thing and then also you know just a, a when i think of like different things that kind of shaped me it was uh you know there's a band trip uh, american music abroad um a bunch of high school kids go to europe and do like a yeah 
two or three week tour. I played guitar in the jazz band. I had no idea how to play jazz guitar. Clueless. Had no idea how I even got the, the gig. Um, but playing in different cities every night like that really just like got me hooked on touring and like that kind of life. And, oh, it gets better and better every night and it changes. And, and yeah, yeah. you're in a different city and just the experience was incredible. And them, you know, encouraging me to, to do that and, and providing the funds for me to do that was like huge, you know? Yeah. yeah. Supportive, supportive. Uh, you're out of it. Okay. So let's bring you back into like, okay. So you, uh, you're in a bunch of really cool playing situations. You never completely deserted being that performing musician. You never, in other words, as your you, studio owner, engineer, producer, some songwriting in there, helping mm -hmm. with help, helping with production and all that. Um, but then you uh, opportunities ar arose where you could uh, you got back into it. Yeah, I thought that was important. I never wanted to be the people that I, you know, I think first and foremost, it's important to have mentors and people who who give you a little bit of direction, um, whether you know them or not, really, honestly, uh, I think the, the types of people whose work I admired were like uh, Butch Walker, I don't know if you know him, who's in the Marvelous Three, which I remember them and then kind of disappeared and then he was in a he was in a like hair metal band way back in the day yeah yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. marvelous huh like south gang yeah. or something south gang yeah yeah, yeah. so and i kind and of i think marvelous three is, i like them yeah yeah pop rock in the 90s yeah. and stuff, makeup and all that good stuff yeah. and, but he produced tons of people produced tons of people but he never alienated his 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 now i'm not like a writer like he is yeah. um, but as far as like i i thought that it was cool because um, he's out there in the field doing it. And I think yeah. he can relate to musicians when they come in. I never wanted to be that guy in a lab coat that's like, you know, mm -hmm. different from the, the artist that's coming in. I wanted to be able to relate to artists. I definitely heard some flack at one point about like, oh, my, uh, uh, another studio saying like, you know, um, we, we don't, we don't, we're not out playing in bands. We take this seriously and everything. I'm like, well, that's what I want to do. I want to be out there because that was building my network. And it was also... Yeah putting me on a level with um, the musicians that were coming in where they could understand, they knew I understood what it's like, you know, I'm not okay. just this Why guy. Why do you suppose people do that? What's that? They throw shade. Well, maybe things aren't working out for them, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's always, it's always a thing of jealousy. It was, it, that's the jealousy or, or uh, um, there's no possibility that, uh, we can both do good in their minds. I'm finding out. I've, I've is, had discussions. Is, yes, with, uh, I've had discussions with some other studio guys and stuff, and it seems like everybody's doing all right and doing well. And I, I think that's cool that like we all kind of have our own little niche. niche. And um, and and you know when you're starting out, you're pretty insecure in your abilities, especially in a studio. There's just so much to to wrap your head around. And if you have a difficult client or somebody like a special, you know, technique that you're not really familiar with, or there's new technology or something that can be intimidating. And I think a lot of times guys, engineers in particular, the engineer types uh, are very insecure mm -hmm. about what we present is what we know and yeah. what we know we, we don't know. Oh, we yeah, that, that, that might be musicians in general. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. 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 Fake it till you make it. You yeah. Know. Yeah. Well, not um, only that, it's like, this is what makes me great. Yeah. Like I can, I can do the, the Van Halen stuff. I can do that. And if you can't do what I do, then you're not as good as me. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I don't, yeah, no, we have different things. But I've talked to some other things. guys yeah. and, and it's always, it's nothing but like, we're just happy to be doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think any of us, anybody I've talked to is uh, jealous or envious or, or insecure uh, about, uh, I think that the area now, it's, there's a lot of established studios and a lot of guys that I think have terrific reputations and um, when I'm not able to do something. Like I had a guy contact me, like a big session to do horns and I wasn't able to do it. And, 
I had like a handful of people to call, you know, and, and then I knew I'm very careful about referrals because you don't want it to come back and bite you, especially when there's, you know, chunk of change involved. Um, but I, 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 now I feel very comfortable about who I can refer to. Mm -hmm. and I think it's terrific. And, you know, it's like going to a, a it's, it's, there's so many parallels to like uh, a barber or a hairstylist, you know, anybody, not anybody could cut hair, but a lot of people can do it. It's like, where do you feel the most comfortable? You know, where does it fit your schedule? Do you have a good relationship? Sometimes you're not even getting the best haircut, but like you just enjoy being in this place. And the, 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 there's another <laughs> studios aren't. Well, it's like band members too. Yeah. <laughs> it's not necessarily the guy who does this. It's the guy who's a, you know, the hang factor is, a, is, is an important part of it too. That's you, I think you, how I got energy. a lot of it. That's how I got. I was never the, the best guitarist. I, I don't think as far as uh, like going for for a gig. Yeah, I think it's just like you said, the ability to kind of just fall in and not be a liability and you know drama and, and you know I was reliable. Show up to gigs on time. I like to have a good time, but like I'm you know still know when to treat things uh, professionally. You know? Seriously, yeah, yeah. Especially so that toured with the underwater. Yeah, that was a funny, like, you know. How long did uh, it last? Was it, were the tours long? One of them was nine weeks. Yeah, I yeah. think that was, like, one of the first ones was, like, nine weeks. The whole country we did down south, across Texas, mm -hmm. up through Cali, Oregon, back across uh, the Midwest. And, mm -hmm. and I think we actually, in the middle of that, we came home <laughs> because uh, to open for Daughtry at the York Fair. That was funny. We're like, it was like a, a, one of those like gig of a lifetime things. And yeah. uh, we're like in like Illinois or some Midwest town and, you know, thinking like, oh, and it was also gas prices were crazy at the time. This is like 2007, I think. And so every drive was like, kind of like you're nervous. You're like, are we going to make, right. we going to have enough money to get to the next gig. <laughs> and then finally get this like awesome gig in a hometown gig at New York fair. And, and uh, we're like, we got to go, you know, so get out the credit cards. Let's make it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But that was, that was a long one. Most of them were like two to three weeks. Um, okay. Yeah. So you didn't really have to, you didn't really have to completely, they're not deserting your job anyway. No, no. I, I, I don't know how but Bob had a guy that um, he um, referred to, to, to fill in and do some sessions. He did a lot of the jelly brick stuff. Okay. Um, he filled in and then my one of my best friends dan newell he ran guitar center for or, or probably around that time actually he was a general manager and he he did some sessions so i had some people filling in and you know i'd obviously pay them and i had, I had a little bit of money coming in on the side which was great but it was it was it didn't seem sustainable you know it was like at any moment this could crash and burn yeah yeah and so but yeah doing the, i was able to come home at the time I didn't, I wasn't in a relationship. I didn't have kids. I just lived in a little apartment and I'd come home and just right to work and yes. for like two weeks and then, you know, all right, we got to go back on the road and pack things up and yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah. But through, throughout it all, that's how you learn to do what you do. And it's like, you, you've done videos, you've been, did you record your own band the underwater digital elvis no the underwater that was actually all that stuff was recorded before i came along okay which was like the greatest gig i thought was like everything was laid out like i walked right into some of the best touring and also you know the band got a record deal and, and we went to europe and um <laughs> did like nothing to get i just like well it's like, like your milwaukee gig yeah, I did nothing to 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 earn this kind of nice. Uh, I mean, there yeah. were definitely some some really bad gigs and some bad routing and stuff on tours. But uh, um, yeah, as far as like, I, I didn't have to write, I didn't have to record, I did nothing, and like they had like some amazing sounding recordings. And it's like, all right, cool. This is my new gig. This is fun. So, Digital Elvis, what? How much were you a part of that? As far as the writing end of things. It started out as like kind of the two of us, Ducky and I, just sitting down and 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 throwing ideas at each other, like completing each other's sentences, if you will. And it was really just, just like let's think of like kind of like some cool 
crazy musical things to add to some, you know, maybe basic ideas and just, you know, we didn't have a band. It was just the two of us. So we just kind of formed sounds around these ideas and, and kind of like just let our imagination run. We didn't know each other that well. Um, it was actually my wife who said like, you know, Ducky's not in a band or anything. And I just, you know, more or less kind of, kind of pushed out of the underwater and I was looking for something to do. And I was like, all right, you know, whatever. And, and so we started working on stuff. I was like, man, this is, this dude can sing, you know, and he's got like great ideas. He's a really good guitar player. It's like, it, it, it was cool. Like I said, we kind of finished each other's sentences in a way. Um, and then put a band together around it um, with the help of uh, a manager and, and just um, didn't really tour that much. You know, we did some runs, you know, New York, Philly type stuff. Um, uh, the videos are going to be attached to this, the video you sent. A couple of them, because I have two different two different eras of that configuration. The earlier thing was much like kind of alt rock, noisy, cool, uh, with Matt on bass. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, uh, but with Dana, then there's Dana. Yeah, yeah. Again, that was the, my wife's really good friends with Dana and... Um, and we just thought like a duet would be cool to do. And yeah. I was like messing around with this little riff that had just originally started out as like a sludgy, like in my mind, like a black crows kind of riff. And so then, who were your favorite, who were your favorite bands, your go-to bands with black crows were your vibe. If you could do, if you started your own band, like around right out of college were the black crows, the thing that, that was like a, a little bit of everybody. Okay, like, I would say like Alice in Chains and Stone Stone Temple Pilots, just like fulfilled a large amount of my cravings. Yeah, uh, you know, STP had a lot of Zeppelin tendencies, and um, Alice in Chains had a lot of bluesy tendencies, but in very weird ways. And so it really, for whatever reason, those two bands really drew me in there's a band called failure that i'm like infatuated with who is another the the singer of that band um and i guess he plays bass and guitar kind of switches off ken andrew he's an incredible mixer producer um he i think he did a lot of the recording stuff in the in the 90s and then when they kind of dissipated due to record label stuff he carried on his production um and mixed a, a bunch of big name bands and um and produced them and um, so that, in addition to Butch Walker, like same kind of idea of like, here's a guy that's out there with bands doing stuff, but also has a really good uh, production thing going on. Um, Cause there's a, there's a lot of big name artists that try their hand at recording. And I think they're like kind of selling their brand. They don't know what they're doing. You know, they yeah. get a production credit. Oh, come record to so-and-so. And they're just, you know, collecting a check. And like, yeah. there's a lot of that, you know? Yeah. Um, but those two, I know that they are just like really good at what they do. Where there's a lot of a lot of guys, I don't know a lot of guys, but it's like uh, people who know how to make their sound. Yeah, yeah, yes. That's, that's yeah. not a that is not a. I don't consider that a really good produ producer. You're not just making your sound. You're. I trying to lift up the sound of what you, of what you lift up the people that you have, and uh, that's a really interesting point. That's, I've talked about that a lot lately because um, sometimes sometimes people want that. They're like, I loved what you did with so and so. Can you do that for me? And I usually say, Well, you're not so and so, you know. Like, yeah. and I I don't have a magic button that turns you into that person because I do know some other engineers and producers who are like that. That like, if you work with them, your stuff is going to sound like their stuff. Yeah, well, they they play all the instruments. Yeah. Yep. Yep, and they wrote the song. They rewrote yeah. it. Um, like you can hear the melodies and stuff. Oh, that's because so and so worked on it. Um, and that—that's. Don't get me wrong. There's a, definitely a place for that. Yeah. And the people that do it are often very good at what they do. But it's it, that's it's a different. Really, that's a different thing. Yeah, it's two different things. And and I have that discussion with people. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to, you know, make you sound like Taylor Swift, or you want me to make you sound like you? You know. Yeah. Um, yeah especially when people come in and ask for like auto tune stuff. I'm like, 
that's already been done. Like maybe we should kind of, you could use obviously pitch correction, but let's maybe not make it just sound like something that's already on the radio. Yeah. Well, let's make it sound like something that isn't noticeable. The yeah, auto-tune. That too. That's yeah. yeah I really, everybody uses cool. autotune, but for you to sound like a robot when it is a song, when it is a song that isn't that way. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's, yeah. That sounds kind of ridiculous. In other words, some songs auto tune's great for. I'm not that old that I can understand that. <laughs> but uh, but I can yeah. But anyway, um, so production. Okay, what what makes a good producer? What makes a good producer? What what are the what are the what do you do as a producer? Producer is probably you know somebody who's able to hear um, a song in any form you know stripped down or produced and um not I shouldn't say produced but like you know fleshed out with instrumentation and they can figure out what's going to make it pop and make it stand out and make it catchy and relatable to i guess we're, we're trying to reach a, a, a big audience you know um so sometimes you hear you know a melody or a lyric it's kind of like inaccessible or too vague or, or, you know, we're dealing with like attention spans a lot and, and music and like, okay, is there too much going on here? Not enough. Do we have to cut, you know, this verse in half and just get right to the next part? You know, you're usually trying to keep a song flowing and, um, and also just to kind of taking different textures and, and using them you know, you're basically packaging a song to deliver, to try to get, to make it the most accessible, I would say. Yeah. And it's like, it requires every skill that you've ever had, probably. Like, it yeah. You've been yeah, you've got to play. Everything, everything you've been exposed to in the orchestration. Yeah, yeah. You know, all that stuff is there, whether you know it or not. Uh, little, like, like songwriting, arranging. Mm-hmm. Okay. Obviously, the more you do it, if you do this all the time, you have you have a if you build songs all the time, you have an idea about what works and what doesn't. And also, like when to call in somebody else, you know, like okay, sometimes people want guitar on someone like, well, I can do that, you know, that's no problem. And then they're like, well, I want, you know pedal steel or slide or something and i can play some slide you know but like i'm not you know Derek trucks and uh yeah, yeah. so or, no or it'll to, take it'll take us six hours to get a guitar solo down yeah which so is, which, knowing when to to outsource uh and and who to call on like you know using your network your network is like i think the biggest thing is like you know that's how you get uh, stuff done you know uh expanding your network um you know calling on favors at the right time you know yeah. not taking advantage of people but you know forming relationships where kind of help each other out here and there and you know when when you need somebody or you need a piece of gear too you know you can call and maybe i don't have the right piece of gear for that you know mm-hmm. knowing what my limitations are and not trying to be like an ego maniac and trying to do it all myself but also being mindful of budgets you know sometimes people you don't want to put them in an uncomfortable position where they're going to have to foot the bill for some crazy orchestration you know that nobody can afford um and it makes a, a, a project go sour because of how they're in over their heads you know yeah, yeah the cost yeah 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 that's a big one too that's the worst part is the budgets i mean i hate those conversations but that's make the world go around, you know, it's like, yeah, well, well, do we, do we, we put in a, a string section or do we, uh, some, somebody's really good with keys and strings with keys and somebody, yeah. can, okay. The difference, the difference is thousands of dollars. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, and sometimes you don't know that's maybe, maybe that maybe some people can consider that to be, uh, the autotune of uh, the orchestra, <laughs> yeah. but sometimes it's absolutely essential. Well, so I'll share like a little technique that we used um, for a band called Say We Can Fly. Um, Nike from, he plays with the Badleys 
is one of the the newer more oh, recent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The violin, mm-hmm. uh, violin or fiddle, depending on what genre you're, you're talking. Um, he came in to do some fiddle. session work. <laughs> they did came in to do some session work for uh, for say we can fly and um you know i i thought i wasn't really sure what exactly um i quickly realized that they wanted like an orchestra at times i'm like well it's just one dude like you know yeah he could do a violin section and maybe even viola or something but this dude can't do cello but he's like oh no i can i can do that you know so he got out like an octave pedal and started putting that like that. Part. yeah that's and, it uh, and then there were also some parts that you know we just uh so we had the the human factor the authentic violin sound you know doubled and all you know mapped out with parts and stuff and then also added some like lower tones using uh midi you know uh-huh. um, and you, you listen to it and it sounds like a freaking enormous orchestra at times and it was just one dude you know and uh you well, know, he is, I, from everything I'm hearing, he's a genius. Genius is a little far now. He is actually, yeah, and he's like the nicest dude on the planet. Yeah, and he's on time. Like I'll show up to the studio and be like there waiting. Like he's me. the best. He's the best band member of every band he sits yeah. in. You, you know, every band he's in, he's like he's the most talented guy there. Maybe That's, genius is not the right word. Maybe yeah. genius is not the right word, but he's he has like he has all the stuff in every band. Yes. And he knows how to use it. Yep. Yep. And he's, he's a great guy. He's really thoughtful and considerate and um, really easy to work with in a studio, easy to talk to. Um, easy, yeah. Um, yeah. An ideal guy. You know, if you're going to put together a dream band, he's going to be in it. Yeah. yeah. An all-star lineup. Uh, but any, that's, that's, you know, knowing, okay, well, so we can't. And that's what you want out of studio musicians in general, right? Guys that can be able to, Guys can be able to come up with the right part with the right time, in the right time with the right sounds. Yeah, and they don't, yeah. They don't necessarily get it. In other words, they try different things. Yep, they take direction. You yep. can communicate on different levels. Like it could be on a theory level, or it could just be, um, you know, you pick up a guitar and play a part, and they pick yeah. it out from here. Replicate um, it. Yeah. So I mean. Those, those how, how much types. is how much is a uh, notation used uh, uh, like just overall in general and no in your in your in your world <laughs> you, uh, you, you write out very, people, you write out arrangements is that a thing that happens i mean a lot of chord charts but uh um yeah but as far as like actual notation um there's like one guy um he's awesome james mosher he's a he's a pediatrician actually and he does arrangements um writes cool songs for like little symphonic arrangements sometimes he wrote like a folky song and he did the the guitar part he wanted me to play this classical kind of style thing um and he gave me the notation i'm just like what the heck is this you know it was like my brain hurt trying to 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 go back like 15 20 years when i live in the valley college he would read on guitars like I and then I forgot like you know you go through a piece and pencil in all these different notes you know what fret that this note is on and um but I had to do it in parts you know very and and um he brings in scores to do stuff and and it's cool though because I I do enjoy the it keeps me fresh and I think that's important the only time I've ever I've ever encountered uh standard notation on a gig is when I when I produce the chart myself <laughs> and i will do that sometimes because of uh for in other words if it has to be done absolutely the one way yeah there's something absolutely no it has to be this for the song for the song, for the song to be right but you just, go ahead what's that oh no yeah, just when i'm when i'm in a, like in a gig or in the studio i think people are mindful of like just the time and most of us haven't exercised that notation muscle to the point where it's the most efficient mm-hmm. method to, to communicate. So I used to be hard on myself when I'd be like, oh my God, I don't even, I don't even know if that's a B or a C, you know, like what the hell am I looking at on the, the, the staff? Um, or especially notes below and above the staff, <laughs> like those like are the ones Letter that are like, what is that? Yeah. Um, uh, 
I was hard on myself for a while because I'm like, why did I learn all that? You know, and then, but it comes down to what's the best method to communicate and being mindful of time and the flow of the session. Um, some musicians I've recorded, you know, don't nail something until like the eighth take or some of them nail it in the first and second. Some of them are so consistent that they plan everything out. So if, if they, in the first three takes, that's all you're going to get, you know, um, and sometimes that's when you use pitch correction because the feeling was there. Um, I think uh, one thing that like I, I always sticks out to me is um, I read one of my favorite songs is I Can't Make You Love Me by Bonnie Raitt. It's like the, one of the craziest, most emotional songs, I think. Yeah. And I was reading about it and, um, and apparently she only did it in one take because she's so exhausted emotionally. She put everything into it that she could only, she couldn't even sing it again. She was so drained. Yeah. Um, and I think, that, but going back to a producer's role is like knowing when to say when, or when there's some left in the tank that you could go for, mm -hmm. when to push a musician, really understanding the musician's, uh, um, the psycho psychological uh, makeup, mm -hmm. get the best performance. When to, know, when to know you're not gonna get that out of them. And I've had some singers, um like last week i was working with this r&b singer you might know uh, diane wilson um her daughter one of her daughters her daughters are like incredibly talented and she the one um melissa came in to work on a track and and then her uh boyfriend came in at one point he's like oh you need to do that over and i thought it sounded really good and then when i sat back and listened to what he was saying he was right like you know like he and sometimes you know you have to humble yourself as a producer and be like you know what it sounds good but he's right like it needs to be the emotion wasn't fully there i was listening on a technical level you know looking at the meters looking at the compressor everything's sounding good and everything but like he's right like the song is about a breakup and she doesn't sound upset or pissed off or anything and i was like yeah we should keep this Let's do it again, you know. Um, that's she, she agreed. I'm sorry? And she agreed? Yeah, I think, and that's the other thing is the approach, you know, a, like a, a big thing is you have to leave the egos at the door. So when somebody does throw out that idea that it's not from a place of an ego where it's like, no, we're here to help. We know that this, we're constructing, uh, constructing something. Um, not for ourselves, but kind of for what the universe and, and it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about this song. And um, so that's important. That's not always, that's can be really tricky in the studio uh, is reading the dynamic um, because one eye roll, one, you know, kind of negative Nancy comment or any kind of tone could just deflate a whole session yeah uh, just like that i've been there and it's heartbreaking to be already have everything going and then just you know the wrong comment or the the um so so you have to be very tactful and mm -hmm. and, and people will that's one of, the, that's one of the, the biggest things that this is also jobs of a producer is to understand people, people oh my god but like uh, I've like my personalities and personalities and all that kind of go ahead. I would say like, as far as like what I feel like I bring is of, of value because everybody wants to talk about gear. Everybody wants to talk about gear and, Oh, did you hear what so-and-so did on their record? Did you hear, you know, they're so caught up in, in what I consider things that don't really matter that are kind of secondary to like the song, you know, um, and also the emotion and the vibe. The vibe is like everything. I've I've made really subpar in my mind, you know, technical recordings that have a vibe there. I go back and listen to it and it just like makes me feel a certain way. And that's really, you know, it might have the worst snare drum sound because we the this the the drummer might have, have not had the patience to tune it properly, or maybe I or just know how. Exactly. Or uh, or you know you know, sometimes it's tough to like approach somebody else's gear and, and start tweaking it. Um, but 
they nail the part and they nail the, 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 the song and the vibe is there. And um, you go back and listen to it and you're like, why was I even worried about that? Now, out of tune guitars are a different thing. I will rip people apart for that. If there's something, the guitar is out of tune, yeah, yeah. that doesn't fly with me, but, um, or not intonated. But as far as other, other of, things like you play out of key or you play too much, yeah. these are the things that you would talk about as a producer. It's like, you know, sure. It's, it's less is more. It is a cliche, but some, not, sometimes more is more. <laughs> but mostly, no, mostly that you get yourself in trouble by thinking that by playing more, it's going to be better. Exactly. And, and, uh, Bob, actually, he made a good point. He worked with a band like right before I had come on. And, uh, I guess they had, uh, they were a cover band. I think he had done some work with them and, um, they were going to do an original tune. And he said, they all came in, the guitarist and the bass, you know, they all came in just playing the same chords. Like they didn't have parts, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think, that's a big thing. Um, arranging. Arranging and realizing. Don't, like, don't everybody play the Wonderwall chords the same way. If your arms are all moving the same way, that's like. <laughs> I've had people, you know, add a third part harmony and I'm like, well, now you sound like a barbershop quartet. Like it was yeah. better with just two. And, yeah. and like, you know, knowing. Um, yeah. And, and, and like, okay. Like less isn't always more, but just you know, common sense and not feeling the need to throw everything. Oh my God, the bands that have like, I might get in trouble for this, but the particip participation trophy bands, you know, um, drive me nuts. You know, they have a song and I'll be like, why do you even have on that? And they just feel the need because the drummer's going to be hurt if we don't, you know, let him play on this song. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, but the song doesn't, there's no need for percussion. Listen to it. It's just jumbling everything. It's a ballad, you know? Yeah maybe a shaker, but like not a drum kit, you know, and, and, but you get some bands that are just so, and that's why I've really paired You're navigating personalities in a band. I, I I've really let go of recording with bands because of, of what you just said before a few minutes ago about being kind of a, a therapist or a mediator. Yeah. Um, it became, you know, a babysitter. It's like, I, I, I I'm, I'm kind of past that. Like it, it was exhausted. I realized what wears me out, what exhausts me in a studio. And that's it is like having to coddle people. And, and not that I'm not, mm -hmm. good to, I'm not a jerk or anything. At least I don't think I am, but it's, it's exhausting when you're trying to tiptoe around people's egos and, and not offend anybody. Whereas when you work with just an individual singer songwriter, um, you can cut right through it. And they know that like, you're not, ripping them apart but we're trying to work together there's yeah. not putting anybody in a in a corner in a line of fire i think um in most social situations this is true you ever have a friend that like he's really cool when it's one-on-one -on -one, but then if you're ever in a group he might like throw you under the bus and make you like the butt of jokes and stuff and you just don't really like him in a group but mm -hmm. when he's when it's just you two you really yeah it's it's cool and that that happens a lot and it's what happens a lot in the studio, you know, one guy becomes kind of like, you know, the target and, and then I have to kind of mediate that. And then there's like, you know, whoa, so-and-so didn't work out his part or like, you know, it turned, and then people get their back against the wall and get on the defense and it just creates a negative energy. So with working with that's, just, that's all negative energy. Yeah. 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 So I, I, not that I don't like working with bands, but, um, I, I i'm mindful of it sometimes i'm like all right we're basically just making a demo because if i interject in this it's gonna it's gonna backfire so you, i'll just put mics up you guys can basically make a demo mm -hmm. um and then other bands they really lean into me and all of them and uh those are the that's the best and i lean into them too i'm like oh man i know you're capable of doing this and what's your what's your ideas on this what's your thought you know, creates a vibe in the room that it's just everybody feels comfortable offering their, their input. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets made fun of nobody, you know, there's no like resentment coming into the door. Yeah. Yeah. But that's tough, especially on a local level. Um, Cause we come, you know, I, mean, I remember it growing up, you know, like thinking of the bands that I started with, like this guy had no business playing music. He just his parents bought him a guitar and we needed a bass guitar, you know, for example. 
no no offense to bass guitar <laughs> those are the usually the hardest ones to find though and then um then you get kind of Absolutely. you're a bass player too so don't even talk <laughs> yeah yeah exactly but i was never like i was i was like the last one to like you know give up the guitar if, if right. somebody's like, well, we need a bass player i'm like not me not me you know somebody else yeah so, um but I, that, that the underwater was a cool example of like i just wanted to play music with that dynamic they had one of the best drummers on the planet at the time uh, matt halpern and i was just like i want to be in that band i don't care if i'm playing tambourine yeah. or whatever kazoo i just who want to be in that band. Playing with now i'm sorry who's he playing with now uh he's big with uh periphery is his uh, that's who he's playing with now yeah yeah he's he's, okay. he's, he's big time i only played one gig with him though. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but, but that my one, point was it's, it's, okay. it's, the vibe was I just wanted to be uh, I saw what was going on there and I was like I want to be in that I don't care if I'm playing yeah. whatever you know whereas other bands I'm like nah I ain't playing anything else but guitar and I'm going to play this kind of guitar and if you don't like it then then get somebody else yeah get somebody else no, know yourself know yourself you don't have to take every gig that's yes saying no is a it's tough because again our egos get stroked it's very flattering when somebody asks you to be a part of something it's very flattering especially if they have some recognition um and and you know in, in front of good crowds and stuff um knowing when to say yeah it's not really for me that's that, mm -hmm. there's an art to that um but like you like i've played i i, I don't want to name any of them but like you know played a couple gigs where i'm like not really into the music at all but it was just the the vibe and the people and it was fun i mean i'm playing with the amy simpson band now and i it, it for the most part it's not really my style of guitar playing but like everybody around me is killer and awesome people and it's yeah. like again i'll play whatever to be in this band i can't believe that they wouldn't find a better guitarist but I'll take it, you know. Yeah, cool. yeah. And the cool thing is, like, they're just all such good musicians that I don't even have to play a note, so yeah. they can carry me. Wonderful. I can just, Wonderful. I can just turn my guitar down, just turn the volume down, and just mm -hmm. fake it. And... Sounds good, guys. <laughs> well, thank you, Derek. Thank you, Derek. So, everybody watching this, you're again the green room in Harrisburg you're focusing a lot on what you you say uh a lot of the singer songwriter i it's a small studio so i i, okay. I think it's easier to um and and more budget friendly I, I like to do uh yeah singer songwriter i do a lot of hip-hop stuff um, okay not the young you know crazy stuff but more old school stuff okay uh, guys my age that are um still that that's a cool that's a genre that, that you know we kind of like witnessed forming in our lifetime that yeah. is awesome to see it's, it's so relevant that is still relevant yeah. jumping on i love working in hip-hop some of my biggest you know successes or uh, recordings are hip-hop tracks i love you do have kind of, all kinds of sounds right you're, you're not a, yeah. you're yeah. not just a does it do you know people that are just specific to i guess that happens I guess that was never really for me. I mean, coming to Harrisburg was just like a big eye opener. There's so many, there's a lot of gospel, you know, yeah. and I didn't grow up in the church at all. So the first time I did a gospel recording, I was just like, what's going on here? You know, who's steering this ship? And it was a bunch of killer players and they all kind of knew when to play off each other because they rehearsed, you know, multiple times a week in a church. And, you know, that everything that, that was to me, that was like the first time I was like, oh boy, I need to broaden my horizons because I was just a 90s rocker, you know, classic rock and 90s yeah, yeah. rock. So, um, but it really comes down to the the, the, the people um, and also just like the, the their approach to the music and stuff. Yeah. I found that the rock stuff is a little bit more difficult because I'm so immersed in it that I get a little bit more nitpicky and, and yeah. at the back of my mind, I'm like, just give me the damn guitar. Let me play it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> What I also appreciate about what I heard from you is like you picking up a mandolin. That was you on mandolin, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, That's that cool was nice. Story. That was a that was nice. Well, thank you. That was a, that Ducky was a cool and story. Ducky and Dana. It, it, I that that was like an old harmony. My uh, uh, 
Oh my God, what is he? Dana about? Alexander. What what's she going by now? Somebody told me, isn't she going by another name? Oh, she, uh, I know it's Patty Labelle. Zoe Zoe Labelle was a she, okay. she did a thing with um, a record with uh, the guys from Live, and okay. they pitched her as you know a stage name. Um, okay, but she did some background vocals recently for me on a children's record. Um, which she did a fantastic job, you know. So she still does a. She's very, very in, uh, involved, um, but she's just. I don't think she's performing. She has uh, two kids that are around the same age as, as ours, and uh, so she's just doing the domestic life, I think, for a little yes. bit. Yes. We'll hear more from her, I hope. Uh, but, yes. But the mandolin was uh, that's was, that's fun. That was an interesting instrument to kind of. I still I have a long way to go with it, but you know, but just you're, taking, you're, you're probably right stuff. Well, I'm sorry. You played the right stuff. Oh, thank you. Well, I couldn't play anything more than that. <laughs> well, that's all right. You don't need to. Yeah, yeah. And it's like it was good. It was good stuff. That whole that whole thing was like I enjoyed that. I had a history. It was a history teacher. Yeah, and it was slash track coach who uh, had a mandolin. He brought one into class one day, and um, he let me kind of like fool around with it, and I figured out you know the tuning and the 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 strings. What are they called? Strings are elegant. Yeah, it was immediately, you know, play uh, Maggie May. Was best yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and losing my religion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the two songs, but um, Battle of Evermore. Uh, he he, like I think offered to sell it to me for like fifty bucks or something, and I had a crack in it or something, and I took it to my guitar teacher. And I was like, well, what can we do to kind of rehab this to get this, you know, up and running right? And I forget what he said. It, I, I paid him for something, and I. I think I even took it back. I was like, oh, it sounds like it's going to cost too much to repair. And my teacher was like, just, just keep it, you know? And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, I don't really play it that much. And it seems like you're interested in it and everything. So I still have it to, to today, this day. And was that the one you played on? Yeah, that's it. The harmony. Yeah. Okay. So wherever Matt Delford, if you're still out there and kicking, sure. just uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Absolutely. Great room, talking Harrisburg. To Green Room Harrisburg. Anyway. <laughs> See you later, everybody. See ya.